Broadcasting live from Willy Wonka's Spiced Wonder Worms, this is Pop Culture Reference, your one-stop reference for all things pop culture. I'm one of your hosts, Seamus Connolly. And I'm Garrett Strother. And I cannot tell you how excited I am to talk Dune Part 2 with you today, Garrett. I, I think we've had a lot of thoughts brewing. You've actually had the chance to see it again, even in the last couple of days, so I'm really excited to get into it with you. I am too, but I, we cannot start talking or else we will not stop talking yes, about yes. it. And we do have news to get to. Starting with the passing of legendary comedian Richard Lewis. I have most of my Richard Lewis knowledge and association with something like Curb Your Enthusiasm, where he is maybe one of the best parts of the entire run of that series. But I know I've seen, I've seen clips here and there of his younger work, and he is just absolutely legendary for a reason. Incredibly funny guy, obviously. I do think that he's probably best known at this point for being on Curb, but I love him in Men in Tights. I was just about to say the only other thing I really know (laughs) as the prince. He's very, very funny in that. Also, he has a kind of different role in Leaving Las Vegas, if you've ever seen that, which... You know, he's a little funny, but it's not um, its not a typical Richard Lewis mm. role, as you would not think it would be in that kind of movie, so. Well, I have not seen that movie, but I know that's one that I've been told many, many times to finally get on. Well, it's its its hard to watch. It's a oh. sad, it's sad, it's Nicolas Cage as an alcoholic in Las Vegas. And Sounds it's like bad. a laugh, right? It, <laughs> it is not, but... Yeah, he, I mean, an incredibly funny, talented guy who, it's also sad, ironic timing that, like, you know, the last season of Curb is wrapping up right now, but he is an incredibly talented guy. He's also one of my favorite interviews on Peter Bogdanovich's Buster Keaton documentary, oh, which I recommend watching, yeah, because I... he's very insightful about Keaton. For a guy who I feel like is mostly known for how glib he is, he really has an understanding of silent cinema and the way that that works. Well, I will definitely have to check that interview out. That would be an incredibly fascinating watch, I think. But moving on to a second remembrance, legendary, prolific film writer and historian uh, and analyst, David Bordwell, one half of famed co-authorship Boardwell and Thompson has unfortunately passed away. We're going to be talking more about Boardwell, his legacy, and his career over in our pop culture reference segment, but I I know that you did not escape your film studies degree without reading <laughs> some some Boardwell and Thompson. And oh, absolutely. He has a fascinating way of looking at films and has been, again, well, I think we can kind of save most of this chat for for the reference segment, but he has definitely been somebody that shaped my, my filmic education as I've become more academic about cinema. Yeah. You and me and probably most of the people in, in any kind of film academia, I would say for sure. Coming up next here though, big news as president of Walt Disney studios, Sean Bailey is going to be replaced by Fox searchlight president, David Greenbaum. Now, Sean Bailey was the man who spearheaded the Disney live-action remake front that has been accosting cinemas for years and years now. <laughs> so I'm just it, this is just a pretty big move, I would say. You know, there's a lot of things going on between Disney and Fox, and all of these different bigger moves like we've been covering on this show are, are seeming to go down pretty rapidly recently. So this this is some pretty big stuff. It's huge news. I will say that I am very skeptical that Bob. Bob Iger it would be willing to turn off any tap that produces money. <laughs> wow. And, you know, the live action remakes, they there are a lot of problems with them, but they make money. So, I mean, <laughs> Greenbaum true. was a good president of Searchlight, I think. And it's encouraging to me that this seems like a step in the right direction. I know it really is the bare minimum when you see things like him in an interview saying that his approach to green lighting movies will be, does this need to exist? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's Which, I mean, it, it, you could take that multiple ways 
ways, too. That could be an extremely anti-art stance as well, but I, I am going to take it in good faith and, yeah, and hope exactly. that this is a positive step forward for Walt Disney Studios, which has been really struggling to produce anything of quality of late. But one surprising thing that Disney's actually producing now are Blu-rays and 4Ks for Andor, Obi-Wan, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and Moon Knight. Finally, all of these things are getting actual physical releases. I believe we tentatively knew that Andor and Falcon and the Winter Soldier were coming back when they did that first drop a few months ago with the Mandalorian and Loki and WandaVision, but I am so excited to put Andor on my shelf. I'll also probably buy Obi-Wan Kenobi, that's a show I I have some issues with, but mm. probably is good enough that I would like to rewatch it. Yeah, I, I agree with that, and especially because it seems like there's some care taken with these releases, with mm-hmm. you know special packaging, and you get little goodies that go along with it, some concept cards and stuff like that. I think that this is a no-brainer for me, and or for sure. And, you know, like you said, Obi-Wan, I'll, I'll throw it on there too, maybe. That, that seems like it would be interesting. If I was going to have it at all, it would be in this really nice 4k release totally some elements of obi-wan are better than others that's what i'll say about that and you know falcon lunar soldier and moon knight i don't think either of us will be purchasing (laughs) you know what man Probably not. Oh, uh, you can take that to the bank <laughs> and cash it. That's what I'll say. Uh, but what do you do? You think we should get into it? Should we should we get to Arrakis? If I could do the throat singing <laughs> noise musical cue uh, that that happens every time Paul does something <laughs> cool, I would do that for you right now, Seamus. Well, I'm imagining it in your in your beautiful falsetto voice. For today's main segment, we're going to be talking about the new sci-fi epic, Dune Part 2. Seamus, this has been one of our most anticipated films for years, and I I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves, but I think it really did live up to the hype for me. Yeah, I I have to agree with you on that. It it truly surpassed my expectations, if I'm being honest. I don't want to glaze it too much, but it was truly one of the maybe one of the best movies I've ever seen, surely the best IMAX experience I've ever had. And I think I can definitively put the period on that sentence. I think I've been thinking about it for days now and it was such an unbelievable, it was like my jaw was on the floor for 90% of this movie. It was, it was insane. I want to clarify that you are stating on air definitively that this was a better IMAX experience than Top Gun Maverick. And that is the biggest point that I had to, like, soul search about. And and that's, you know, I know it's a big statement to make here. I might be losing a lot of my constituent support on this, but (laughs) I, I, it was unbelievable. I've been talking about it to literally everybody who will listen to me. I am, I am part of House Atreides. I pledge myself to the sandworms. It is... I keep thinking it's like the first time I've been able to be like, oh, this is an Empire Strikes Back. This is a Two Towers. This is something that I got to see when it happened that I know is going to be like cinema history, I think. This is, it, it, it blew me away. I am similarly enthused. I do think that having the benefit of having seen it twice now, there are a few things that stand out to me, but. What an improvement, I think, over the first film, which I already really liked. There are so many insane turns that this takes that many people have used as reasons for decades that Dune is inherently unadaptable, that audiences not only seem to accept, but excitedly engage with. And I think that's a testament to how well not only... Villeneuve and Fraser are able to present those ideas, but also I think everybody's acting has stepped up from where they normally are for this film. Yeah, everyone is giving like the best performance I've ever seen, even for the actors who are literally on screen for moments even. They are they are just giving it all and not only delivering on that promise of the first chapter, the first part of Dune that we keep going back to, that that locked us in back when it first came out, but it's like 
double tripling down on that promise for whatever part three is going to be. And as much as I want to delve into the Dune verse, like really, really get into it. The fact that I knew nothing that was going to happen in this makes me so sure that I have to like move even further away from thinking about like reading the book, watching the Kyle MacLachlan one, you know, like getting really into it, but I'm, I'm saving that for when, when Timmy Chalamet brings us across the finish line. Speaking of uh, Willy Wonka himself, Timmy Chalamet, <laughs> He is giving a performance that I did not know he was capable of giving. I mean, I've always thought he's a really good actor. I enjoy him a great deal in things like Little Women and mm-hmm. The First Dune and even Wonka, <laughs> um, which I think we said similarly on the show when we covered that a few months ago is a different kind of performance than we've ever seen him give and exceeded our expectations for what he would be able to do and he's doing something entirely different here, whereas he, and it's a continuation of his work in the first film. In the first one, he is much more of a blank slate. Mm-hmm. He is stoic and pensive and kind of tortured, which is a running theme, I think, throughout the early films in his career. Things like Lady Bird and, to a lesser extent, Little Women are definitely in that realm more. And then to see him take that approach, which is still present in Dune Part 2, and feel so much more comfortable carrying a movie of this size, he has clearly grown a lot, not Mm -hmm. only as an actor, but as a collaborator. I think that his chemistry with his co-stars is much more palpable in this film than it was previously. I think the standouts in the last movie were his relationships with Oscar Isaac and Jason Momoa, neither of whom are in this film. So seeing him really connect with Zendaya, who is giving a really, like I think her best performance of her career up to this point, Rebecca Ferguson, who he was already good with in the first film, but amazing dynamic here. And her performance is far more elevated than it was in the in the last oh yeah so i overall i think that he has just and maybe wonka was part of that you know been able to grow into really carrying one of these major films and i couldn't look away from him i thought it was terrific work from timothy chalamet yeah i i hate to say that like oh the most popular actor in the world is like maybe really good but like he's finally grown on me enough through dune and wonka i think specifically that he is truly he's up there for me now i loved watching him be this like almost shy especially with the the fremen angle of things in the in the first dune and in the first act of part 2 but by the end of this movie he is like like you said, like unlike anything I've ever seen him even try to accomplish before, but he is just owning that really powerful role that he ends up in towards the end. You and I also regularly bemoan the loss of the talented movie star, and this movie has four young, talented movie stars, which I think uh, is a really... And I guess I you could even go as far as to say five, because Rebecca Ferguson is still young and relatively new on the scene, I would say. Sure. I mean, she's really been in the public eye as long as Chalamet has. So seeing Timothy Chalamet, Zendaya, Florence Pugh, Austin Butler, and then also Rebecca Ferguson really be able to step into iconic roles where they are central to the film of this size and their charisma, their actual genuine acting talent, and their chemistry are all working together to produce great performances and elevate their status as quote-unquote movie stars. We don't get to see that very often anymore, I don't think, and it's a harbinger of the ongoing change in the film industry that's going back to a more almost like old Hollywood Mm -hmm. sensibility of building up stars, making films, major events, which this definitely was marketed as. Oh yeah. Oh, that is for sure. And an event it was, I mean, 
I think the fact that you have this stellar younger cast that is just they have this baseline of also people like Christopher Walken and Dylan Skarsgård and Javier Bardem these like these veterans who do have important roles but clearly are taking more of a back seat to be the support in what is going to be like the new pantheon of Hollywood by the time Dune Part 3 is over it's phenomenal it's an incredible ensemble certainly that is masterfully balanced I think for a movie of this length mm. it's incredible how well paced it is how I am never bored in this film how I am also never wondering what's going on with other characters with a cast of this size that is so spread out i mean think about what little screen time a lot of the names that you and i just brought up actually share oh yeah i didn't find myself wondering oh what's happening with this character or this storyline it was perfect at jumping back and forth between each element of the story exactly when it needed to i i gotta say i you've probably been more of a dune part one fan than i have been and i've always found it to be very very good but i i I do think you've held it higher in regard but this is just again the ultimate evolution and it i want to go back and watch dune part one now again having this continuation where i have these characters in a universe that i at least understand substantially more than the first dune stuff they kind of really plop you right into it I also think the part one and part two monikers are more than just that, that truly this does feel like the second half to the first Dune. And I have often, you and I have discussed this at length, rejected the notion that that feels like half of a movie. I do think it is maybe a little, like, a little bit anticlimactic, but it certainly feels like there's a complete journey that's being Mm -hmm. gone on over the course of that film. And it's also doing a lot of really important work setting up characters in the world in a way that if they had tried to fit this if they had made a three and a half hour dune one that also had all the stuff from this movie i mean it would just be a mess and it wouldn't work and we know what happened with david lynch in the 80s when they tried so seeing that full vision realized i totally agree i'm very excited to revisit part one with the new context of part two new dune video games coming out yeah, new that's good too. dune uh short film that i just came across that is supposed to be some kind of very good stuff there's also supposed to be like a bene Gesserit show on hbo i don't know if that's what? still happening well, they announced I... that like years ago <laughs> well now now that i'm locked into the bene Gesserit drama i'm i'm fully on board with that if that ever goes through i will say this that i do think villeneuve it is really clear how much more comfortable he is in action sequences than he has been in previous films because his his other science fiction works that deal with like true action sequences that being dune part one and blade runner 2049 i think kind of jump around them a little bit more and i mean i think there there's probably budgetary constraints with that as well but in those films the action sequences are very stylized i think partially to avoid a lot of straight action and in this there's a much more straight action that being said i still don't think he feels entirely confident in it there i mean there we'll get more into it in spoilers but if there's anything i think that's being held up by the other parts of the film it's the action still that being said i really liked a lot of the sequences yeah, and yeah. was incredibly impressed by the way that he was able to use imax and in a way that i think he like he is now one of the only filmmakers working that i think can fully understand the potential of imax and we discussed last week how we feel like villeneuve and nolan are are buddies in in more than one way but like specifically that villeneuve's approach to this kind of large-scale blockbuster is very much influenced by nolan i think that's both more evident here than ever especially in the film's opening sequence but he also has brought a lot more of his own sensibilities and personalities to those epic scale sequences that i do not think are specifically derived from nolan's work 
And there are, there are, I mean, there was more action in this movie and a lot more of these surprising scenes than I ever thought that they were going to give us in this movie. So I, I would love to get into some spoilers soon. I think I, it's time. I think yeah. it's time as well. I think we crossed, crossed the barrier. So last pre-spoiler thought is go see it on the big screen that you can, preferably IMAX. I think Dolby would be quite the experience, though. It's it's a well. lot about the sound. I say the loudest and biggest you can see it, I, I recommend it more than pretty much anything I've seen in a long time. But let's talk spoilers. Where do you want to start, Seamus? This is the pro- the <laughs> Sandworm City, baby. We had such incredible Sandworm content, including what I have been thinking about for days and days now, which is the Paul riding the Sandworm IMAX sequence that just yes. shook my bones in that seat. That was insane. I don't know what it sounded like in the other theaters around that IMAX theater, but there's no way that everyone in the mall that we saw that it didn't hear that clearly i think that's also the best action sequence of the film which is kind of an interesting thought because it is i mean it is certainly an action sequence but it's not what you would typically associate with being one which one of the great strengths of dune part one and part two is that it treats its story as a true epic which you mentioned earlier and places an importance on small moments that it like blows them up and lets you see them to an almost microscopic degree. It's not just Paul rides the sandworm. It's you face the utter existential terror of trying to harness the power of a being that is thousands of times your mass. And you, f- I totally agree. You feel every moment super impactfully. You're not necessarily afraid that Paul is going to die, but you are in awe of what it would take to be able to do that. I, I was watching that sequence and thinking, I could train for a million years and I don't know if I'd ever be able to take that leap onto that sandworm and that's why I'm almost on Javier Bardem's side I'm almost like yeah he is the chosen one you know he has come to save us all like I know he's kind of running a little bit of a scam for revenge but they, it was a grandfather worm Garrett nobody else it's not it, like they anybody can do that you know well that is, that brings us something to something that we didn't discuss in spoilers at all which is that Paul, the bad guy here. Paul is no, I mean, the Harkin is, they're no good, but this is not a, this is not the original trilogy Star Wars, baby. This is the (laughs) fall of Anakin Skywalker. (laughs) And I mean, obviously, Dune was super influential on Star Wars. We talked about that when we covered the first one a few years back. And watching Chalamet become progressively more unhinged, I think, is the real secret to this movie's success. And I I want to talk to more other folks about it. I just don't know that many people that have seen this yet. Sure about how they are reacting to the turn that this film takes about two-thirds of the way through where Paul really becomes zealous and begins reveling in his role as the ordained messiah. Ultimately, this is a story about a guy who doesn't want power uh, because he's scared of his own lust for it, and then ultimately is is weakened and embraces the the darker part of himself. You and I were discussing a few days after we saw it how similar that arc is to Michael Corleone in The Godfather, oh, and yeah. how he start he starts the film as a, a man with a code and an understanding of the world around him as a violent, cruel place that he does not want to perpetuate the cycle of violence in and slowly is is turned by the callousness of those around him, the attacks from opposing forces that begin as justified self-defense and then evolve into something a lot crueler and a lot more sinister. So cruel, so sinister, and then just absolutely bolstered by your two really weird uncles that are like, yeah, Paul, you should nuke everybody. And they're like giving him the go-ahead, telling him he's God, and then he's like, yeah, okay, maybe maybe I am then. That's one of the wonderful things about this film is they take characters you sympathize with in the first film and like in the first film 
Jessica and Gurney and Stilgar, and they turn them into weird zealots. They they take away the elements of the characters that you like until only like like a super soldier serum the <laughs> darker amplified elements of their personalities are left and I, I think gurney especially is a character whose nuance is really impressive and with a lesser actor i do not think that character's shift would have registered as much that Brolin is so brutal and so battered and and such a veteran of combat in the first Dune that you're just like, well, yeah, so it makes sense that he's this gung ho. Let's nuke all the <laughs> let's nuke all the Arcanans guy. But Brolin is able to make such a nuanced difference between Gurney in the first film, where he's fighting for something he believes in. And Gurney in this film, who is solely after revenge. Yeah, it feel, he is like the last knight of the round table here. He, whatever like duty he felt to the Atreides is mutated and warped by his, you know, sad life. His his boys that he got massacred and he had to negotiate a way out of. And you were dancing around just calling him punished Brolin, but I'm gonna say it. He was he was out there in the spice, and I loved what came out of it. I think. Him and Javier Bardem together on the same side is such a, a a twisted, amazing, weird support system for Paul to rise to power, and it really does break my heart the way in the in the throne room or whatever that is that it goes down where he is like conquering Florence Pugh or whatever. Yeah, Javier Bardem, you bring up, and I think he's a very interesting foil, mm. but also the same to gurney where stillgar is for a lot of this film the comic relief like he's just all, he, oh really the messiah. Good at it. <laughs> he's, he's so really funny. funny and he has you, you said crazy uncle earlier that's totally the energy <laughs> yeah, yeah. he has but seeing that faith that he has be weaponized and turned into a radical force beyond the scope of the the admirable freedom fighting that he represents not only in the first film but at the beginning of this one i think it's such an interesting far cry when he's standing at the end ready to go to to lead the opposing houses to paradise as paul <laughs> orders him at the end of this film For, like you look back at one of the best scenes i think in the movie where he and lady jessica are standing in front of the reflecting pool that contains the water of all the dead fremen and he has such a lovely, articulate, gentle sensibility about his faith and about the price of, of war and how valuable human life is to then turn around and make him this bloodthirsty war lieutenant. Is such a, again, such a great turn mm -hmm. that in the hands of a lesser actor, I do not think would be nearly as effective. Well, he has these smaller moments towards the earlier parts of the movie where they're really trying to integrate Paul into the Fremen, where it almost seems like he doesn't all the way fully believe that he's the messiah and he's like well don't go for the biggest sandworm you know because you know you might it might not work out great and then it's like even he is reinforcing his own beliefs by the end of everything that it's like well i guess this literally is the messiah and i am gonna go to my glorious death waging war for him even though whatever agendas may have been in play with giving him a shot to be integrated into the fremen when paul was still being like no no i'm just a guy i just want to live here with you guys or whatever by the by the end of it again by the whole the start of the holy war that we are we are given promise of for the next one he's like he is as crazy and fervorous as every other one that he was like stirring up in the crowd earlier in the movie and everybody has their drink the kool-aid moment in this it, 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 there's two very literal well, drink the kool-aid <laughs> moments <laughs> um, juice flavored kool-aid with lady jessica and then later paul which is obviously the real turning point for his character, but when Stilgar sees him ride, 
the grandfather worm. That oh, is clearly his yeah, moment of full exactly. devotion. I totally agree. And even the smaller side characters, like the edgy Fremen who are friends with Zendaya, who are just like, yeah, yeah, sure, but thing, Messiah. And then they're like, by the end, they're uh, bigger believers than she is. And like I said, I'm caught up with it. Like, I believe in Paul Atreides as galactic emperor now it's crazy how i i didn't like you know the trajectory the full trajectory of this story Mm. and i was shocked at how quickly this conflict escalated from we're getting revenge on the harkonnens to i'm gonna take florence Pugh's hand in marriage and usurp the emperor as the new emperor i I, not that i'm surprised by that being a a end point to the story or at least a development on the journey but this movie gets gets there so quickly and so believably that i think like zendaya at the end of the film you're just standing there shocked (laughs) it's yeah it's it's a it's a real your jihad were too preoccupied with whether or not they could they didn't stop to think if they should become emperor of the ga- of the known galaxy you know uh, I mean just just that build up for the climax where they're like marching out all the Harkonnen armies and the, the emperor's personal army that's all in the mix and then ju- just from that to nukes to storming the palace ship to declaring war and I will say that last final battle for me is where the action falls down a little bit and that's not to say that riding the sandworms into battle oh. isn't cool and that that one shot of timmy looking at the nuke is an epic and th- i i'm just listing things that are cool about the scene right now <laughs> because there's also the shot the long shot of zendaya killing all the harkin soldiers which echoes paul's vision of the future oh, yes it does. from the first dune but all that being said I think that that final battle leaves a little something to be desired. I don't think it feels epic enough. It doesn't feel like a true siege. It feels like they just get in really easily to the Emperor's ship. And, you know, I don't need it to be Helm's Deep or anything where it's half the movie, but... I would have liked to see a little bit more of of the fighting your way up to the actual entrance and and the other elements of that siege. I just don't think that that quite worked for me, and I think that that's where you see a little bit still peeking out of Villeneuve not being totally comfortable in all of the action elements. I would like that to have been longer myself, I, I, I think, but... By the time we get to the throne room, whatever that audience room is, and we kind of have all the players in one spot, I was kind of at a fever pitch of excitement that I I just, I loved the follow through. I loved the setup for what is to come. R.I.P. Gross Blob Stellan Skarsgård guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, absolutely slaughtered. Good, good stuff. Austin Butler's showdown duel that he offers up as himself as the champion for Christopher Walken. Amazing stuff there. That is an incredible sequence. And I think that that's, if you want to talk combat sequences, certainly the best in the film for me. The choreography is really tight. I also think that Again, Chalamet is showing himself as a way more confident leading man Mm -hmm. in that sequence than I'm used to seeing him. The little twirl that he does, like, he does, like, a ballerina, like, he he jumps and ducks out of the way and, like, does a triple axle (laughs) to get (laughs) away from Austin Butler's blade. That's an insane moment that is played really quickly, um, but is really impactful, I think. Butler, we have not been talking about nearly enough. He is such a superstar in this. It's crazy. He's so scary. He's so, so unnerving. He wears a Darth Vader cape at one point, and I said, (laughs) oh yeah, out loud, full volume in the theater. I mean, and he's got that, like, impeccable... Stellan Skarsgård Harkonnen accent voice that he's doing, too, that's just, like, truly it feels like he is, like, a weird alt human species from whatever culture this is it's it's insane the way that he just kind of ejects his tongue from his mouth like a robot it's so upsetting truly all those marketed actors are just 
gross, doing gross things. I guess maybe Dave Batista's not. I mean, he, I don't know, but he's still, like, smashing dudes' heads and the keyboards yeah, like, and ripping, stuff. ripping jaws off or whatever. But I think the, the movie is also kind of making a point of Batista's not as much of a little freak as the rest of the Harkonnens, <laughs> and that's why he's not as good. That yeah. he's not, he's not Fade Rotha, he's not his dad. He's just, or his grand, his grandfather, I guess they're... Well, someone's grandfather, we'll talk about that soon. Well, yeah, we'll, I think we'll lead probably right into that, <laughs> is that he doesn't have the balance of bloodlust and cunning that is required to be successful in the machinations of the universe. A Harkonnen that does have that is Paul Atreides. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Big reveal. Rebecca Ferguson is the daughter of Stellan Skarsgård Harkonnen, and it is... I mean, that that was a twist I didn't see coming that I maybe should have. Like, that's that's really fun. There's showdown, calling him grandfather, addressing Austin Butler as cousin. I mean, it's so Shakespearean and weird and tangled up, and I love it, dude. I love it. Made me wonder when, during the filming of Empire Strikes Back, George Lucas finished rereading Dune. Oh, my God. Ugh. But, yeah, that's that's a pretty wild twist that doesn't really go anywhere from a plot perspective but is very thematically resonant and also leads direct i mean like it's explicit in text where paul says if we're harkonnens then we'll fight like harkonnens yes oh my god why do why do i like why do i like him he's horrible he's so (laughs) evil i'm like on his side why why is this well they give him a worthy cause and they, I mean, the thing that is so also well executed as a part two in this is they keep taking elements of nobility from Leto in the first film and imbuing those qualities to Paul for evil. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you see, I th- the example that pops most directly into my mind is the part where... During the first Dune, Paul is attacked by the Hunter Seeker in an assassination attempt. And my man with the computer eyes and the little parasol who is who's seen got cut from Dune Part 2 oh, no. um, gives his resignation and it was like, is your pride worth more than my son's life? Why would you deprive me of your service in my time of need? Mm. And that is echoed pretty directly when in the scene of Paul's ascension to becoming the Messiah, which is also Chalamet's best acting in the whole film, Stilgar begs Paul to to face him in single combat Mm. so that he may become the leader of Stilgar's tribe of Fremen. And he goes, why would you deprive me of the best of us? Why am I foolish enough to kill somebody who is worthwhile to me but there is like it's in a much more twisted situation and just like still like stilgar in this scene is not motivated by the same honor that is motivating that exchange in the first dune oh absolutely not the echoes are still there it's again this twisted perverted version of leto's code of ethics i mean god that scene is so incredible just the 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 energy of just like the slow burn that they've been building with his rise his ascension among the fremen to just like the sudden moment of like no it's too soon this is gonna this is gonna unravel everything but he just the power of timothy chalamet a sentence that is the weirdest thing i've ever said maybe he just the grip he has on everyone is so it's like an uncomfortable moment but i'm still completely caught up in how he's addressing everyone and how in control he is and how he doesn't use the voice in that moment he is using Mm -hmm. his own words i was fully expecting him to like sneak in a little whisper of the voice or some some weird shadowy way to gain more control but he's just he's just him in that moment and as paul comes into this verbal role of leadership where he talks way more, I think, in the third act of this movie than he does in mm. the rest of the movie leading up to it, or at least with a lot more conviction. You see 
and I think this is a very intentional shift, Chani becomes essentially nonverbal. She has very few lines for the rest of the film after Paul become accepts his role as mm-hmm. the Messiah. And Zendaya is doing this great eye acting with the, all this nonverbal work that she's doing. I don't think she has a single line in the final scene, but the film still ends on her face. Oh. And she's going through so many different emotions, so many different considerations throughout that sequence. Similarly, Austin Butler is doing a ton of really great nonverbal acting. Chalamet is in there talking up a storm and everybody else is reacting to him and they're doing some great reacting. Yeah, I I cannot wait for more of this. I want to go get my second viewing in under my belt as you have. I want to I want to see Timmy Chalamet and you've also infected my mind by the way to just call him Timmy Chalamet more often than not. I want to bring that Timmy up. Timmy Chalamet. But, oh my god, but he he's so incredible. I I he is one dune away from being like one of my favorite working actors right now and i i think that's insane that that is that even just for my own personal tastes that that is maybe going to be true soon a few things that i want to just highlight that we haven't touched mm. on directly yet Anya taylor joy baby insane but that whole Crazy. the whole baby's <laughs> controlling oh my God. jessica awesome i love it yeah the it's master so weird. blaster thing we have going uh-huh. on with the unborn sister who's like seeing the future because she drank the worm juice while pregnant so cool love that um i like that they have sex in this movie and that it's pg-13 movies don't have sex enough anymore it's a it's both of well i guess there's only one real sex scene between Paul I mean, and Shawnee, and like then you too... have the weird... <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's too, like, implied sex scenes more than anything. Yes. Because you have the sexy scene, the foreplay scene... Yeah, yeah. ...where Fade Rotha and Leah Sadu have their kind of flirtatious interaction in the hallway where he knows that she's there to manipulate him and maybe hurt him, and he goes willingly anyway. Because, you know... Because he's, he's a masochist. He's an absolute creepy freaky boy i it's the it's perfect with the great box payoff that's so good oh, again another great example of part one part two working together totally. super well and that's following the outstanding gladiator black and white sequence where the sun of the planet oh. is making the light that way and so you have people walking through a hallway inside in color outside to black and white that is so awesome Inc- sick sick design and like the weird anti-reverse fireworks that they have to fire over the coliseum because mm-hmm. they have, it's got to be like negative lights or something it just looks phenomenal i want i, I kind of wanted more time on on that planet me too i think it's a really cool um, there's been a lot of like little black and white sequences and not just little i mean oppenheimer is like a third in black and white but it's really great to see black and white coming more full force into mainstream filmmaking i think that's a really great touch and that's such a powerful the infrared cameras that they were shooting on for that sequence really great looking stuff yeah unbelievable looks looks it looks alien How, how else can you put it it looks uncomfortable almost also i just got to shout out the whole action sequence where Chani and Paul are trying to take down the ornithopter while yeah. hiding between the like this Spielbergian action sequence it's such a strong exciting element very early in the film with the rocket launcher and reloading and and a very funny you know Paul running to the next leg to get cover and it and it moves, moves away off. from him that was like an Indiana Jones moment almost you know you know what i mean Exactly, and a a kind of moment that a lot of action movies don't have anymore. So, that super strong stuff overall. Love and Dune Part 2. Excited to see it again. Excited for the inevitable Dune Messiah announcement this week that will probably happen before this episode even goes out. Uh, We're totally going to play that free Arrakis MMO that is coming out, maybe, and it's not going to be good. A a game that's definitely coming out (laughs) and will be good when it comes out. Yeah, totally, totally. But, yeah, Dune Dune Part 2. What more is there to say? Go see it. Go see it. But why don't we go ahead and move on over to today's pop culture reference. Let's do it.
For today's pop culture reference, we're going to be taking a look at David Bordwell and Kristen Thompson. David Bordwell and Kristen Thompson are considered to be two of the premier academic film theorists and historians of the last 50 years. The two met in 1973 when Bordwell became a faculty member and Thompson was pursuing her Ph.D. at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. The two taught a course together, Introduction to Film, which served as the starting point for film art and introduction, which has seen 13 editions, including its initial publication in 1979 and become a standard for introductory film studies courses. Their 1994 book, Film History, is similarly ubiquitous. While working together, the two fell in love and moved in together in 1974. Much of Bordwell and Thompson's writing hinges on neoformalist ideology. Neoformalism is a school of film analysis that incorporates cognitive psychology and focuses a great deal on the thought process a viewer goes through while looking at the aesthetics of a film. Bordwell and Thompson have also collaborated many times with the Criterion Collection. In addition to creating the short-form series Observations on Film Art, which is available on the Criterion Channel streaming service as well as free on YouTube, they have also often contributed to Criterion's online blog and supplements packaged with Criterion's physical media releases. In 2013, Bordwell deposited 125 35mm film prints to the Academy Film Archive, creating the David Bordwell Collection. Especially impressive among this collection is its breadth of difficult-to-find Hong Kong films. Beyond collaborations with film preservation titans, Bordwell also made some of his work easily available online. Beginning in 2012, Bordwell released three one-hour-long lectures about different elements of film history, as well as shorter videos breaking down the form of individual films. Also, after the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, Bordwell made his textbooks on history of film style, Planet Hong Kong, and Pandora's Digital Box, Films, Files, and the Future of Movies, available to download for free as PDFs. As mentioned in this week's news, David Bordwell recently passed away at the age of 76. Survived by his wife and academic collaborator of 50 years, Bordwell was a seminal force in the field of film studies. He and Kristen Thompson helped shape the young field of academia into what it is today, while maintaining the post-structuralism inherent to their neoformalist approach. Following the news of his death, filmmakers, critics, and scholars have voiced the import of Bordwell's work, and the certainty that he and Thompson's legacy will be secure as their words and ways of thinking continue to influence film students of all ages. I mean, I don't think I can think of a single class film production film studies that didn't have some kind of mention of David Bordwell's work in some way. I actually probably still have a couple additions tucked away somewhere that I should probably dig up and brush the dust off. Observations on film art is such a tremendous wealth of, you know, it's not necessarily film school, but they're really great at showing you how to be a better film viewer. And the fact that they're all available for free on the Criterion YouTube channel, I think, is especially impressive. Also, over the pandemic, Boardwell making Planet Hong Kong free was mm. definitely a important stepping stone for me becoming more familiar with Hong Kong cinema and the tropes and, and differences between Western and, and Eastern cinema. So I feel like definitely, even beyond the classroom, uh, Boardwell and Thompson have made an indelible impact on my filmic education. Very well put. But why don't we go ahead and save the rec center? Let's do it. Save the rec center! Now it's time to save the rec center, where we bring you our weekly rec... Amendations. Seamus, what do you have on the, on this spice-filled episode of Pop Culture Reference? Well, I had the pleasure to finally round off the John Wick saga with John Wick Chapter 4. It's insane that it took me this long to finally see this movie. It's got everything I want. J John Wick's there. Donnie Yen makes his fast hands appearance. God bless him. Or, you know, whatever. Uh, it's so... <laughs> you have said, you have said... No, I on know, this, I know! <laughs> on this podcast that you have no problem with anything Johnny has ever said or done. Or done. On screen or off, of course. You can quote <laughs> me on that. 
Oh, man. Well, regardless, he kills it in this movie. It's just so over the top. I love the other ones it, in a way that it's like they're barely in the category of other movies. It's just like, do I want to watch an action movie or one of the four John Wicks? But I got to say, this fourth one absolutely stuck the landing. It is probably the best, if not the second best, of the John Wicks. I think that it elevates itself to the insanely cartoony level that each one has without, you know, showing any disrespect to what is essentially the finale of this part of this franchise. God knows if they'll make more one day, but if they do, I'm definitely going to see them, and you're probably going to see them with me. Absolutely agree. I recommended this a billion years ago when it came out and a year ago i think yeah when we did all the original three for the show and i totally agree it's the perfect balance of the three tones Mm. of the preceding john wick films i don't a lot of people don't like how long it is i don't mind the length at all because it's if it's more of donnie yen hitting dudes with his cane (laughs) oh my god yeah then i don't care I don't, it can be three hours long. That's fine yeah. with me. I mean, it's just John Wick with Chirrut Imwe from Rogue One, and that's literally all I need to know. And I didn't know that going in, actually. I was I was unaware of Donnie Yen's character and what his deal was, but man, was I pleasantly surprised. I'm so glad you enjoyed it, Seamus. But what do you have to save the Rec Center this week? Well, this must be the Tenet episode, because we are inverted. I'm here with a video game rec. <laughs> oh, what? Wow, save the day. Mark, mark your calendar. <laughs> I have recently been playing... This is not going to be a surprise to anybody who is even a little bit aware of pop culture, and I think this is something we've already brought up on this podcast. Helldivers 2 is taking over the world with good reason. <laughs> if you ever wanted to uh, recite the monologue that bill paxton gives at the beginning of edge of tomorrow as you stream down onto (laughs) alien planets to eradicate terminators and the bugs from starship troopers have i got a game for you (laughs) just arcadey enough to be stupid fun just advanced enough to not be totally mindless helldivers 2 is truly a perfect balance of the multiplayer sci-fi combat that you would expect from a, you know, a major triple a FPS, but it's a third person game that has a lot, had a lot more care and personality put into it. I think than a lot of the massive games that you're, that we're used to and that, you know, some of us might play uh, more regularly than others (laughs) for professional or non-professional reasons. Mm, Of course. Um, so I know that I have not yet worn you down to download this, but I've been playing with a few friends of ours and been having a great time every time I, I hell dive in hell divers too. Well, I have nothing but respect for a game like this of this magnitude. That's so incredibly popular and for what it is for being the price point that it is that has me interested in it more than anything is that i don't have to pay a full 70 dollars for what is going to be i think what seems like a very long lasting game like something that's going to stick around for a while so i know they're updating it a lot and i know it'll be on sale sooner than later god i hope so because it looks incredible it looks like so much kit Like, the one thing for multiplayer games to really hook me is chaos, and it looks like nothing but chaos, so I I am personally sold. Well, I'm very glad you and I are going to have to hop on sometime soon. But I think that wraps us up for this week's episode of Pop Culture Reference. If you want to reach the show on social media, on TikTok, Instagram, or Twitter, you can find us at PCR underscore podcast. Email the show at popculturereferencepod at gmail.com. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, engage with us on any platform you can. It really does help us out. Next week, in honor of the 10th year anniversary of Edge of Tomorrow, we are watching Edge of Tomorrow. It is going to be absolutely incredible. I was a late convert on this movie, but not only is Helldivers just making that come to mind more and more often... It's just one of the my favorite 4Ks I have. I am so excited to talk about it with you next week. Me too, dude. One of my favorites of all, t- not just of my 4Ks, of all time, I would say. I, I'm right there with you, dude. 
But everybody, we will see you next week. Adios, Atreides.